Happy Thanksgiving and welcome to episode 237 of A Geek Leader Podcast. I'm your host, John Rauta, and today's sponsor is A2 Hosting. I've been using A2 Hosting solid state hosting solutions for our website at geekleader.com for many, many years now and absolutely love their support, their service, and all the features that you get. You get access to cPanel. You get all of the things that you can imagine for a great WordPress experience, including their A2 optimized WordPress, which does extra security checks, extra lockdown. You can lock down your editor uh, files so you can't edit anything inside there. You get alerts whenever there are file changes that are done. Um, You can also do automatic updates, backups, and more with A2 hosting. So highly recommend it. Go to geekleader.com slash A2 to get more information and to sign up for their solid-state, turbocharged speed hosting today. Again, that's geekleader.com slash A2. All right, Geek Leaders, in the show, I've got Aurora Winter, and she is um, a author, speaker, coach, helps people that want to monetize themselves. She wrote a book called Turn Words Into Wealth, and one of the reasons why I wanted to have her on the podcast is to talk about how to be a better communicator, because as leaders, we need to be able to communicate. We need to communicate well. She also has a neuroscience background and a TV background, so that's kind of close to my heart. Um, So we're going to talk about all these cool stuff, and I'm sorry that I'm talking fast, but I'm excited to have Aurora on the show. Welcome to the show. Oh, I'm so glad to be on the show with you, John, and look forward to giving everybody some tips that they can use right away to rise in their job and profession and rise as leaders. Hey, before we get started, do you mind telling the audience just a little bit about how you got to where you are today and how you um, kind of pivoted your career into doing what you're doing? A very circuitous path, but like you, I have a background in uh, film and television, although you're still active. Um, I always thought that writing was something really close and near and dear to my heart, and I loved writing. I've written a bunch of uh, screenplays and had a, a movie produced with good old one arm push up Jack Palance. Oh. But after a while, I realized there's so many people out there with messages. And yet they typically take three and a half years. A first time author takes three and a half years to, to write a book or write a screenplay. And so I thought, hey, I've done this in a lot less time than three and a half years. Maybe I can help others. <laughs> so I most recently launched uh, Same Page Publishing, and we focus on helping uh, leaders uh, write publish and promote their books, but we do it the spoken author way. None of this staring at a blank page. Instead, uh, speak your book out, like somebody like me will interview you and then turn it into a book for you. Take all the drudgery out of it. Yeah. So that makes uh, that makes it a lot easier because you can take people that do go to conferences and speak at conferences and turn a couple of those talks into a book. Is that what you're saying? Exactly right. Well, I believe you, um, you know, you've spoken at a number of conferences yourself and recorded it. And there you go. If you've, if you've given a keynote speech or you've given a couple of them, that could be the, the backbone for your book. And if you're not a speaker, you can, you can interview yourself or you can have somebody interview you, or you can have a professional publishing company like same page publishing, do it with you. But there's so many ways that are faster and easier than staring at that blank page to, (laughs) to write a book. And 80% of people want to write a book. I believe that a book is, is one of the ways that you can set yourself apart as a leader. You can come to the notice of other people inside your business, inside your company, inside your industry, but also outside your industry. And you yes. can get on cool podcasts like this one. Yeah. So um, <laughs> I think I, I think having a, a book it, it is one of the ways that you can get your name out there. And one of the ceilings that a lot of um, people in tech run into is being known outside of their company. Like you, know, you yeah. can become a, a big fish in a small pond, but it's hard to move out of your company and move around unless you're known outside of your industry. And I think speaking at conferences is definitely one of the ways to do that. And another way is to have that glorified uh, business card of being a book that you put down, you know, um, as you can show off and say, hey, these are my thoughts on this specific subject. This is this makes me the expert on this subject and why my career should should flourish. <laughs> that, exactly that right. Like people throw away business cards, they throw away brochures, but they generally speaking keep books. And while I've written myself, I've written six books, not including not counting the ones that I've ghost written. Um, I've used just a really short book as a way of creating a minimum viable product or testing an idea. And somebody who's working inside of a company, they have a lot of expertise and they're probably repeating, you know, the same answers to the same questions over and over again. Why not simply record the answers to those frequently asked questions, turn it into a little book. It's so easy to publish nowadays. And 
then there, bing, bang, boom, you've got a calling card to speak at conferences. You've got a way to get known better within your company and um, in a more broader field. You can start speaking uh, you know, on Zoom, on meetups, at, at conferences, at events. Who knows? Maybe you can speak on the TED stage as well. So you can also just use a, a little book. And my book, Marketing Fast Track, actually was based only on a one-hour interview. It was an interview like this that the director of coaching for Tony Robbins did with me. I was pivoting my, 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 uh, my business from one thing to another. So it was something new. And he interviewed me about marketing and messaging communication. I liked it. I transcribed it, turned it into a little book and bing, bang, boom. I had a book and, uh, and that helped to really uh, cement my position as leader in the communication space. Yeah. And another thing about books, like you, you mentioned that people tend to keep them. I, I get being a podcast host of, you know, this show, I get, I don't know, more, more than a book a day <laughs> mailed to yeah. me. Uh-huh. Uh, and uh, I don't, I don't throw them away ever. Yeah. I don't read them all, but I don't throw them away. And actually at my um, office at work, I have a huge bookshelf uh, in my office uh-huh. and I put them all there and people from my team come and get them. And then when I run out of space, I take the the least uh, visited books from them. And I, <laughs> and I give, we have a little counter in our office that, where people like put books and I set them out there and they always disappear. Someone takes them. And yeah. so, so if you don't reach the person you give it to, you, you know, you're definitely going to reach someone else on the line. You know, they're going to be passed along and exactly. they're not, not thrown away. Well, a book is a really great way to leverage your message one to many, not Mm. one to one. The other thing, I mean, I love technology. I love videos. I love uh, all the things that we can do on on YouTube and other places online, but it's also very valuable to have something physical so that you can um, alternate between online and offline communicating or or digital and, and analog. So um, a book, even a little short book can really help set you apart as a leader and, and bring you to the forefront of attention. But I'd really love to share some practical things that people can do right away to communicate more effectively. I, I have a lot of clients who are geniuses. They're super smart engineers or scientists and analytical people, but they're too smart for their own good. <laughs> and a lot of times they do not communicate and it's typically because they don't understand the neuroscience of communication so i i need help with that because <laughs> i i not because i'm smart no but because i struggle with with communication and, and um any anytime i could you know improve that is definitely something that i'm interested in and i'm sure this is going to resonate with some of the people listening as well so come on give me some tips okay so there's three <laughs> there's three three steps to communication and once you uh, remember these three steps your communication will be 10 times more effective I, I promise you so the university has taught many of us to become much worse at communicating because it's given people the idea that if they send the verbal equivalent of an excel spreadsheet to somebody else <laughs> that, that somebody else is going to open it up with excel and understand all those numbers and and get it quote quote unquote. Um, And that's one of the disadvantages of being smart and being university educated, (laughs) as I am, I have an MBA. But the truth of the matter is that we evolved over many years, human beings evolved over many years, and you need to address the communication in three steps. And I'll explain this to you in a little story. I'll be I'll be demonstrating what I teach, which is to, if you share it in a story, it's much more memorable. So the first step is you have to address the ancient reptilian brain or the croc brain. So let's just imagine you're a knight in shining armor, John, and you're race up with a really important message that you want to deliver to the king and queen in a castle. And you're there and you're on your black stallion and you charge towards the castle. Now the decision maker, which might be your boss or it might be somebody uh, you want to enroll as a client, you know, is is metaphorically speaking that king and and queen. But back to the castle, you're on the horse. Do you immediately get to talk to the king and queen when you arrive? No, you do not. The Man. castle is surrounded by now, right? <laughs> the castle is surrounded by a moat, and there are crocodiles in the moat. So you have to get past the crocodile brain first or the croc brain or the ancient reptilian brain. And that's not as hard as it sounds, but it certainly is not receptive to an Excel spreadsheet or the verbal equivalent of one. You need to demonstrate that you have something new or shiny or useful, something to eat or mate with, something juicy, something good. That's all. It can be a very brief message. For example, the title of of one of my books is 
turn your words into wealth. Okay, so there's a benefit right there. So you you communicate at a very broad level in just a sentence, something to uh, give permission for the crock brain to say, oh yeah, we're not gonna eat John and his beautiful stallion. <laughs> we're gonna let them pass. All right, so the drawbridge comes down, you've communicated effectively to the crock brain, and then you're uh, escorted into the center keep of the castle. But are the king and queen hanging by the gate waiting for you, John? No, they are not. <laughs> they are in the center throne room. But who is inside the capital, castle? are other people. There's nobles, there's stable boys, there's aristocrats, and they give you the sniff test. So the second test is the social or status sniff test. So you need to communicate after you've given your really quick message, something of value, like we're going to talk how to be about how to be a geek leader. The second thing is, who are you and who sent you? And should we trust you? Should we give you a bit more trust? So, you know, we, uh, hu humanity over many decades <laughs> learned that the way to survive was in a tribe. So do you pass the tribal test? So for example, with my book, Turn Words Into Wealth, it's won nine book awards. Okay, so that is passing the social sniff test. Other people think it's okay. Or I could say that my work has been endorsed by Dr. Wayne Dyer, who you might know. Okay, so that's, again, addressing the social sniff test. John, when you say that you're the vice president of technology for a TV network, that is passing the social sniff test. Okay, so that's step number two in your communication. You've got to communicate that so they don't throw you out and go, ah, we don't believe this person, nobody knows him. And this is actually a reason a lot of people don't get promoted at work because nobody knows you and you don't uh, network enough and you're not speaking enough to get known. Okay, so then the third step is a noble, a stable boy will take your beautiful stallion, <laughs> a noble will lead you into the throne room where you have the opportunity to address the king and queen. Now, anybody who has watched the Game of Thrones knows that the danger is not over. And in fact, you still cannot send the equivalent of an Excel spreadsheet, even when you're addressing what we're going to call, you know, the right and left hemispheres of the cerebral cortex. Well, this, it, you have finally reached the decision-making uh, part of the other person. Uh, still, the decision they're thinking about is most is, should I keep listening or should I <laughs> not, right? So you want to uh, I'm going to oversimplify because this is not completely uh, accurate scientifically, but for the benefit of remembering, let's just assume that the, uh, the queen, Cersei Lannister, uh, let's assume, we use that role model, likes stories. So the feminine part of everybody's brain or the emotional part likes stories. And let's assume that the other part likes data, likes statistics, likes proof, likes analysis. So you need to mix up the way you're communicating with stories and with data. And then you also uh, mustn't be speaking for an hour straight. You have to get permission to give more information in little bits, which is exactly how a podcast works. Like I talk for a bit and then you say something. So you're speaking to the king and the queen. Maybe you talk to them for a couple of minutes. Then they say, oh, tell me more about that. And then you tell them more about that. So to recap, if you can communicate, remembering these three steps, your possibility of being heard and understood and celebrated and promoted as a leader will go up um, maybe tenfold. So first off is the crock brain. So what is the big picture? What is the benefit of listening to you? Very short and snappy. Two, who sent you? Address the social midbrain and show that you have sufficient social capital or sufficient status or other people that they know like you or trust you. So play that social status card. And then third, when you are addressing the decision maker, alternate between stories and statistics. And those rules will stand you in good stead, no matter who you're talking to. Does that make sense, John? Yeah, it makes perfect sense to me. And, you know, I think it's one of those things like when, when I think about, you know, I guess it was step two, the um, building social capital and having that social capital, um, that's where a lot of people fall short because it seems like that's something you've got to do ahead of time. You know, mm -hmm. you, you mm -hmm. can't, can't just like, Oh, I need to go talk to somebody. So look, let me pull out my social capital. But if you haven't done the work ahead of time to, to be ready for that, um, th then you're going to be struggling when you need it. You know, it's almost like a bank account. You got to put money in the bank first before you can withdraw it. 
Mm, I love that. Yeah, it's exactly like putting money in the bank first. So, you know, when you started speaking at conferences, you were making deposits into the social capital yes. bank because then you could say, hey, you know, when I was recently speaking at XY conference and they're like, oh, wow, not only is he a speaker, but he was at that conference. I know people from that conference and then people will make positive comments and you can share what they said about your talk and, and you build so that you're speaking to bigger and bigger audiences and you're getting better and better. Yes. Um, a good example of a crock brain message that relates to communication. I'll tell you another little story. This yeah. actually floored me when I found this out. It's from the book called Significant Objects. They did a, um, a test to see whether an object with a story would sell for more than one plain Jane without the story. So they put a hundred distinct objects on eBay either with a story or without a story. And the stories were written by all kinds of different people. Some were professional writers, some were amateurs. And the stories added significance, but they weren't necessarily hypey stories or selling stories. Some of them were simple things like, this pot bit was from my grandmother. And I always remember how she baked chocolate chip cookies for it. And every time I look at this pot bit, it gives me a warm and happy feeling. I hope you like it, you know, something like that. Uh, what they're arranged. There were even some that were kind of creepy. But anyway, the stories added significance. So I want your guess, John, uh, whether or not the, the, the same objects with a story sold for more than the ones without. Well, I think it's obvious the ones with a story. How much more? Oh, 50%. That's what most people guess around 50%. 2,700%. Yeah, 27 times more. So I really want everybody listening to think about that for a second, because you're probably working extremely hard at your job. You're doing whatever you're doing to the best of your capacity. But if you are ignoring spending some time working on your story, then you're potentially leaving so much money on the table. And what you know, I'm not saying you can get paid 27 times what you're getting paid, but hey, wouldn't you even <laughs> like a, a raise that was 50% more or some yeah, percentage more? And so, I mean, I made this mistake when I started working as a film and television executive. I just worked hard and I didn't spend enough time sharing the story about what I was doing and why it was important. And that, that was a, a rookie mistake that I made and that many other 20-somethings make. So, yeah, so... Uh, as you spend a bit of time thinking about the stories that you'd like to share about your leadership or about whatever you're up to, it will pay really handsome dividends. So how do we develop that storytelling um, skill? You know, because uh, let me give you, I, I know exactly what you're talking about because I, I've, I've used it from time to time, but it's one of those things that I, I have to retell a real story. <laughs> I can't like make something up. I'm not, 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 not very good at that. And, and the example would be that, um, um, th there was a guy, I use this when I talk about like uh, the fact that we, when we're building software or something like that, we need to go and experience it for ourselves, not just, not just listen to it. And um, there's a guy named Doug Dietz who gave a TED talk um, God, probably 10, 15 years ago now where he was, he, he Doug is a guy that um, uh, designed a uh, MRI machines. And if you ever had an MRI, you know, you sit in this little tube, like you lay down on this little thing, it's like a little donut kind of rolls over you, like a giant donut goes around you and it's really boring. You hear all this loud noise. It's really um, not fun, not painful, but just, just kind of a boring sit there and listen to loud sounds and be very still for 20, 30 minutes while you get this, this thing. And when Doug went to go view his machines in action, he went to take a field trip. Um, he went to a pediatric hospital and he discovered while he was there that it was terrifying, horrifying for him because um, probably 80% uh, of the patients had to be sedated in order to go there because these kids were like terrified of seeing this, this machine. You want to stick me inside this machine with all this loud noise. It stinks. It smells like hospital in here. It's, everybody's got lab coats on and masks, and it's really scary, right? Um, so what he did is he took that idea and from going there and went back and painted the MRI machine to look like a pirate ship or to look like uh, a space spaceship and put music in there where you could hear sounds of you know comforting music for the kids and told them when they get out they get this treat and because of doing all of that the number of uh pediatric patients that had to be sedated before getting an mri dropped from 80 percent of them to less than 20 percent wow that's so, a great story you know so i can tell that story because i've heard it you know 
<laughs> yeah. <laughs> but how do I come up with those things on my own? Well, uh, it's so right to tell stories from other people. That's totally fine. And um, but most people don't appreciate their own life stories, their own mm. their own uh, business or career stories, and they just go, "Oh yeah, well that happened." Here's how. Well, well, firstly, the story that you just told about the MRI and the huge difference that it made when uh, the MRI machine was painted like a spaceship or a pirate ship that the uh, the number of freaking out children <laughs> reduced from 80% to 20%. That's an example of framing. Mm. So he framed the context of what happened next by painting the MRI machine. So with our words, we, we frame what's going to happen next. And it's just as powerful as painting the MRI machine and can has a, as big of an impact of people 80% freaking out or not paying attention to you, <laughs> yeah. you know, versus 20% freaking right. out or not paying attention to you. So framing is something that you can do even, I mean, you are a published author. You've got a, a book that you published in 2015. Mm -hmm. So right away, if you mention that you're an author, you are framing your authority. Right. Because authors have authority. When you mention that you're a vice president of a, of a TV uh, network, you are framing what comes next with that authority. So what result do you want? And then think about what story or what you know information drop would frame it to create the results that you want. So um, yes, all communication is actually strategic manipulation, but this is okay. Um, I want to say in defense of that, most people think that because they can talk, that they can communicate effectively. But I don't think anybody who's listening to this would assume that because they know how to, uh, to, to dance a little bit, that they would be able to deliver a beautifully choreographed performance of a ballroom dance. So we know that ballroom dance is choreographed, it's strategic, it is practiced, there is a plan, and it should be the same with your communication. Hmm. So, and, and lean into that and master it instead of just winging it. So one of the ways of thinking about uh, good stories, and we'll see if this evokes something with you, is think about how do you want to shift the framing? I love the story that you just told about the MRI. The other way to think about stories uh, is what is the turning point that you want to draw attention to? What is the change or the transformation or the shift uh, that you'd like to draw attention to, which is later in the story? So the framing example we just had, the turning point is another way of looking at the stories in your life. So John, if you want to tell at the next uh, convention that you're speaking at, or in five minutes, <laughs> if you <laughs> want to tell a story about being a geek leader, then you would you would need to think, well, when in my life or career have I experienced a shift, a dramatic shift, a dramatic improvement in my leadership? What happened to create that shift, you know, so that you've got a quantum leap of before and after? And then you just, you look at your life and you go, and I'll give an example for myself in a second so that you can, you can see what I mean. And then maybe you do have an example that you would like to share with us about a turning point about being a geek leader. So you, you just go through your life and it, you can also share stories of other people. That's fine. Uh, but your own stories, nobody else has them except you. So they're the best if you can think of one and think, you know, when can I see a time that I was shifting as a geek leader? What were the struggles before that? And what was the difference after? It's a um, compressed form of the hero's journey, which you know you may have heard a lot about working at a TV network. <laughs> Certainly mm -hmm. I know a lot about. So here's, I'm gonna tell you an example of how I did this and you can see how strategic it is. And then everybody listening, like whatever you want, your colleagues, your coworkers, uh, the, the people that you're leading or the people who are leading you to think about, think about that turning point. Okay, so when I wrote my book, Turn Words Into Wealth, I wanted to think about, well, what was a turning point in my life that related to communication 
where the before and after were drastically different? And what was the struggle leading up to it? And what did I learn? And how could that benefit others? Okay, so here's a little story. And again, when you when you can, if I just told you my my takeaway, it wouldn't stick in your brain if uh, compared to if I tell it to you in a, in a little story, which, well, I'll just demonstrate and you'll tell me <laughs> if that's mm-hmm. so. Okay, so when uh, many years ago, my, my husband died suddenly when he was 33 and our son was four and he was my best friend and my business partner. And as you can probably imagine, my life totally cratered. I didn't have a business partner. I didn't have a husband. I didn't have a job. I didn't have a career. I got nothing. So at the time I was a screenwriter and uh, it's not that easy to make money as a screenwriter, as you probably know, John, but I did get an opportunity to share the screenplay that I was working on at the Banff Film and Television Festival. There's a whole story about how that happened, but I'll just skip through that. Let me just say that before getting on to this stage to share uh, the screenplay that I was writing, I was, I was freaked out because <laughs> I'm like, I've never pitched my movie at all, let alone to 600, you know, uh, leaders in, in the field of film and television in, in Canada and Hollywood and, and around the world. I don't know how this is going to go. If it doesn't go well, then I can blow my reputation once and for all and be humiliated because even if they're not in the audience watching, it's going to be televised and aired on national television. Um, so it was a, a mixture of emotions, but I was really determined. I needed to find a way to provide for myself and my four-year-old son because there was nobody else. So I, I practiced my, my, my uh, pitch for my movie and then I shared it in one 20 minute session. And that one 20 minute sharing of the movie that I was working on and my vision changed the entire trajectory of my life. I got an amazing job as um, in film and television as the head of development for Canada's largest film and television production and distribution company, which was then Atlantis Films. I was able to provide for my little family of two and able to provide quite handsomely. And I was able to do the work that I really loved. So it was a huge turning point. And what I learned is it wasn't so much about me burning the midnight oil, making my screenplays better or writing yet another screenplay. It really mattered to focus on communicating what I was about and that 20 minutes to the right people at the right time with the right message can change your life. Yeah, I think that's that's 100%. uh, It's a great story to tell and a great thing to, you know, to to hear too, to give you encouragement um, along the way. Um, I do have a question though, to kind of change the subject just a hair. Uh, You mentioned earlier on that 80% of people out there want to write a book at some point in their life. That's right. So I am sure because of that, and and because I know my audience, that uh, a large portion of my audience probably want to do the same. Yeah. How, you know, I've done this, like I did it the old fashioned way, uh, you know, many years ago, and it was painful and and difficult and time consuming. How how, how do you help people um, do this um, in a little bit easier, more meaningful way? Yeah. Oh, I love doing this. So I um, basically what I like to do is I like to take my skills as a, as a successful serial entrepreneur and as a storyteller and, um, and as a coach (laughs) and interview leaders and experts about their area of expertise. And it's so easy for people to talk about things. And then we have audio and video, which can be sliced and diced into hundreds of pieces of social media to broadcast just before the book comes out. And we also transcribe the material and that can become the foundation of the book. Obviously it needs polishing and such not, but for example, I reverse engineer everything to meet the objectives of the, um, of the person. So we did a book called keys to a healthy smile after 40, which was from, for some dentists. And I came to understand their business, which you know, just a regular person who pops in to see the dentist might spend a couple hundred bucks, but somebody over 40 might spend five or $10,000. And so the thing to do was to attract 
people over 40. And that's why it's called Keys to a Healthy Smile After 40, Seven Secrets to Feeling Seven Years Younger. And that took their business from $1.5 to $6 million by changing the average transaction size and the lifetime value of a customer. But examples in the tech space, I have several clients in the tech space and their communication didn't actually turn into books yet because they're so busy running their businesses, but it turned into people understanding what they were about. So for example, I work with uh, the CEO of Blueprint Reality, Tarney Williams is his name, based in Vancouver. He came to uh, one of my events and, and I teach people how to communicate from the front of the room. The first time he got up at the front of the room, everybody knew that they liked him. They knew that he was really smart, but they had no idea what Blueprint Reality did and what his business was. But after you know attending the rest of the event and um, mastering some communication skills, when he stood up at the front of the room, and shared again what he's up to and his vision for a better future. People in the audience not only got it and clapped and applauded, but they invested in his company or some of them did. Mm -hmm. So it, it wasn't that he had to change his what he was doing or what the value was that he could provide, but he needed to communicate that value more clearly. And when you communicate that value more clearly, that can be turned into a keynote talk. It can be turned into a book. It can be turned into a video or a series of videos, or it can become a podcast. So I really encourage people, you know, what do you care about? What legacy would you like to leave? And how can you leverage your communication so that you're not just communicating one-to-one? -one? Mm -hmm. I think most people in tech are not that interested in one-on-one -on -one results. Let's see if we can multiply the impact of your leadership and your message. And speaking at a conference is one way, a book is another way, videos are another way, podcasts is another way. Why not do all of them? Does that answer that question? I kind of went off on a tangent there. Yeah, yeah, I think it does. So um, if someone wanted to go through this process, maybe they wanted to put together their own book and uh, and they've already given talks that have, you know, kind of a, uh, an agenda of where they want to go and how they want, how, how they want, what they wanted to come out. They're just not sure what the process is. Um, how, how would they con connect with you and go through, go through doing that? Uh, well, the best thing to do is go to my website, which is my name, aurorawinter.com, A-U-R-O-R-A-W-I-N-T-E-R.com. You can get some free resources there, some free books and free videos. And you can also sign up for a complimentary business breakthrough session. And then I'll jump on the phone with you and explore your idea for your book or for your message see if it's a fit and we can go from there. And whether or not uh, we work together, the, the call is fun and informative and people leave with greater clarity about their message and the impact that they could, could leave in the world. Awesome. And I'll link that up in the show notes too for anybody that uh, gets there and also link a copy of your book, um, Turn Words into Wealth. And uh, it's been great talking to you. I've had a great conversation. Oh, I really enjoyed it, John. Thanks so much. If you enjoyed that episode, please uh, leave a rating and review in Apple Podcasts. I'd greatly appreciate that. And also, don't forget to check out merch. We have some t-shirts that uh, I've designed that are on at geekleader.com. Um, you can click on the merchandise uh, section there and check that out. And also, don't forget about the books from our guests. So if you like this guest and other guests that have written books, please um, go ahead and check that out at geekleader.com. I would greatly appreciate it, and I'm sure they would too.